I could spend the next 30 minutes of the time that I have telling you what a privilege it is to be here. Not only to be here in this church sharing with you, but to be sharing the platform with Dr. Bill Bright and also with Bishop Howe. And of course, the wife of my very good friend, Joseph Foreman, Ann Foreman, who'll be sharing with you after I speak. But the purpose that I have in coming here is, is simply to say this, that I am a servant of Jesus Christ, that if it were not for Jesus Christ and the power of his Holy Spirit alive in me, as I believe that he is alive in you, otherwise you wouldn't be here tonight, that the things that I'm about to share with you now by way of my own testimony never would have taken place, and, and the courage that it would take to stand here in this pulpit to encourage you and exhort you in the way that I'm about to couldn't happen either. So I just wanted to give all praise and glory and honor and power and authority and dominion and majesty to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. It's him that I serve and him that I delight in. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a priest. I'm not a, uh, a teacher of the word. Um, I'm just uh, a cop. And I'm really not even that anymore, and, and you'll understand why in just a few moments. But I do have a ministry in the body of Christ, and that is to exhort or encourage. And, and what it says in Romans chapter 12 is, let the one who encourages, encourage. So what I want to do tonight by way of encouraging you is to challenge you to be able to answer this one question when you walk out of here tonight. One question. Given the state of affairs and, and things that we'll share tonight, I want you to walk out of here asking God this question. Lord, what is it? that you want me to do? What, what is my place in the kingdom of God? What is, what is the opportunity? Is it true that I have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this? And if so, what is it that I'm to do? Because I'm not going to tell you. It's not my place to tell you to answer that question. That's the place of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit answered that question for me about four years ago when I became very much aware of a fact that I had simply dismissed put to the back of my mind, as all of us have, and many still do, and that is that it's a baby. It's not any more complicated than that. If you don't believe it's a baby, everything that I say from this point on has absolutely no merit and makes absolutely no sense. It's a baby. And as a police officer, four years ago, I became convinced that they were murdering babies. And more than that, the police were being used, and still are, to protect the property rights and the business rights of baby killers. You see, what's happened is our Lord Jesus Christ himself have sent, has sent you and I and others like us to stop the killing. And depending on what we're doing, the police are being called to arrest us. Now, there are people that have been jailed for blockading peacefully and prayerfully the doors of killing centers across America. And there have been people, myself and my good friend Joseph Foreman and others, maybe some in this room, who have been arrested simply for kneeling and praying on a public sidewalk outside of a killing center. And the police have been sent to arrest the ones that Jesus Christ has sent there to stop the killing. In January of 1989, after much consternation and finding myself in a dilemma, I realized that the Christians that were blocking the door of a killing center in front of Las Vegas, Nevada's third killing center, 92 of them, were doing my job as a police officer. You see, they were preventing the death of innocent human beings. Those were the police officers that were doing the job rather than the ones in uniform. And my fellow police officers, men and women that I'd worked with the last 10 years of a, a nearly 20-year career as a police officer, those men and women in Las Vegas, Nevada were being sent there to drag the Christians away from the door. And it was a very simple thing for me. I, I knew that as long as the Christians could sit there in front of the door of the killing center, then the babies that were out in the parking lot safe and secure in the womb of their mothers for the moment could not be brought in across the threshold to the killing center and be murdered by this paid hitman that we call a doctor. But if the police 
remove the Christians from the door, then the babies were brought in and they were killed. It's not any more complicated than that. I wish that it were more complicated. You see, if it had been more complicated, when I asked the Lord what I was supposed to do, maybe I would have found an out. Many people were telling me, Chet, you just need to stay away. You don't need to get involved. I was three months short of being vested for my early retirement, and that seemed like a pretty good reason not to, to risk being fired or, or risk trying to prevent the arrest of the rescuers. But I imagined months down the road perhaps having having a conversation with a girl who would come up to me and say, you know, Chad, if you'd been there, perhaps, perhaps I wouldn't have had my baby killed. Why weren't you there? And all I would be able to say to her was, well, I, I had to get my retirement. And she would respond and say to me, but I have a dead baby. And all I could say is, I have my retirement. And as a legitimate a reason as that seems, I knew that Jesus Christ was requiring of me in that moment, in that time, to intervene and try to prevent the arrest of the Christians that he sent to peacefully, prayerfully, nonviolently block the doors of this horrible thing that is a, a euphemistically called an abortion clinic, but is just a death mill in our country. And that if the police drug them away, the babies would die. And I had a responsibility before God to try to prevent their arrest. And so I did. I was on duty, in uniform. I was a motorcycle officer. I got on my motorcycle that morning and as I reported for work and went to the killing center and I got off the motorcycle and I crossed the parking lot and there were all of these Christians, my very own pastor among them, blocking the door of this killing center. I took a bullhorn from one of the rescue leaders, not because I needed the rescuers to hear me, they were seated around me blocking the door or the, or the media that were right here. They didn't need the bullhorn, but there were 50 police officers out there in that parking lot, men and women that I'd worked with. I wanted them to hear what I had to say. So I made a plea for their life. I very simply said that the highest calling of any police officer is to save an innocent human being. What could we do? I want you to know that at that particular moment when I was pleading with my fellow officers to try to stop the killing, not to arrest the rescuers, I thought in my own mind that I could never look back at one time in my life, 20 years as a police officer, and point to that day when on that day I could say that either by myself or in concert with some other person that I saved someone's life. My supervisors, after I made my plea, they were not impressed. <laughs> they came up and they ordered me to leave, and I suppose I could have walked away at that time and maybe just suffered some form of discipline, a reprimand, a fine, or something. But I had become convinced that what I said was true, and I am still convinced of that. Jesus Christ himself has sent Christians to stop the killing and the police officers are arresting the ones that Jesus has sent to stop the killing. And I said to them, I can't walk away from a murder in progress. And so they arrested me on duty in uniform. And they took me to jail and they stripped me of that badge and that gun and that uniform that I'd worn so proudly and they jailed me for 24 hours. 24 hours with 92 people that had done the one thing I'd wanted to do as a police officer and that was to save someone's life and then through the process after I was fired and the appeals and the Civil Service Board reinstated me finally I got my job back because they thought it was wrong for me to be terminated that it was too severe of a punishment for someone that had never been disciplined before so I thought I was going to be going back to work as a police officer but the sheriff he obtained he obtained a, an appeal and won that appeal, kept me from going back to work, and I ultimately lost my job, and he won. So the media, they were very interested. They wanted to know how I felt, whether I'd made the right decision. When it was finally announced nine months later that I lost all my appeals, and that as a, a result, I was no longer going to be a police officer, 
So we had a press conference. We set the, the TV cameras on the sidewalk in front of the killing center, which was behind us. And sure enough, as the cameras started rolling, the first reporter said, well, Chet, tell us, did you make the right decision? If you had it to do over again, would you have done something differently? At that moment, I was privileged to turn to Brenda, who was standing next to me, 18 years old. Nine months earlier, she'd been 17, a juvenile, seeking an abortion she didn't want, and one she was being pressured into having by her mother and her boyfriend. And I asked her for her son, six weeks old, Joshua John. Joshua means Jehovah saves, by the way. And I lifted that baby up and I held him in front of those cameras and he kicked and he waved his arms and he drooled all over me and did those things that babies do so well. And I said, listen, had it not been for these 92 people that blocked the doors of this killing center, this baby, this one right here, would have been cut to pieces, ripped out of this mother's womb and crushed by the industrial garbage disposal in this killing center. But he's alive. You ask me if it's worth it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely it's worth it. Would I do it again? I have been privileged to do it 50 or more times across this country in the last four years. I've seen a lot of jails in this country, not as a police officer, but as an inmate. And I think it's a tragedy, and I think it's a travesty that Christians are being arrested for standing for righteousness. And whether you're blockading the door of a killing center or whether you're standing in a public place and preaching the gospel or whether you're kneeling where the government says you can't kneel and praying to Jesus Christ and going to, to jail, it's wrong. But is it going to continue? Absolutely. In this next year, and I'm not a prophet, but maybe I'm speaking prophetically when I say in this next year the Church of Jesus Christ in America will come under an attack unprecedented in its history. Yeah. Do you know that there are men who are corrupt that will sign the death warrants of children that will be placed into power into this nation this year because Christians evangelicals and Catholics these men cannot be elected into power without the evangelical and Catholic vote these men will sign the death warrants of children. And the church would rather do that and look for an economic Messiah, hear me, and be polluted by the world than to defend the cause of the widow and the orphan. There is a pro-death agenda. It's not just a pro-choice agenda. It is a pro-death agenda in this country. Jesus Christ himself said, that before the gospel can be preached to all nations, or at least during that time, I believe, we will be arrested. And Christians across this country need to realize that it's not just abortion. It's not just the slaughter of innocent human beings that Christians are going to be arrested for. But brother will betray brother to death. Ann Foreman, her husband Joseph Foreman, led a rescue of Christians who tried to feed a girl that they were trying to kill in Missouri about a year and a half ago. All they wanted to do was they wanted to, to go to where this girl was being held captive and give her something to eat because her parents had obtained an order allowing them to starve her to death. Her name was Nancy Cruzan. She died on Christmas nearly two years ago. Now, brother will betray brother and children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Don't think that it's not going to affect us because the time will come, you see, and surely now may very well be upon us where euthanasia will be something that will be forced upon some of you here. Maybe the handicapped maybe those who are terminally ill. Maybe you've reached your 71st birthday. The question is, what are we going to do as Christians? Are we going to say, as I could have said, and by the grace of God, I would have said had Jesus not intervened, but I have this retirement, this, this thing, this, this idol in my life. 
Nobody would have faulted me for that, you see, because that was a perfectly legitimate thing to cling to. But because I did not do that, I'm, I'm graced to be able to stand here before you and share this testimony. Oh, by the way, did you know that Jesus Christ knew more about the Nevada Public Employees Retirement System than I did? He knew what I did not know and was not to find out until a month after that press conference, 10 months after I was fired, and that is that officers, even those who had been terminated, could purchase the time remaining. And so I had three months left to my tenure, and so I purchased for $2,800 three months of time, secured my retirement, and now every month I receive a check from the state of Nevada. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus, for that. But you see the miss that could have happened. I could have missed God. The blessing would not have been there had I looked at that thing that I thought was important in my life. Well, I want to close with this. Deuteronomy. My wife and I were sharing together in this passage. Deuteronomy chapter 30. There are nine verses. Just allow me to read them to you quickly. Starting in verse 11. Now, what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. Can you hear that? <laughs> it's really not difficult. Listen to what the Lord is saying as he talks about this challenge before us. This thing, it is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven and get it and proclaim it to us that we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you may have to ask, well, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may have to obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart that you may obey it. You see, there is no doubt. It's a baby. And those of us who, who do not doubt that fact and know in our heart that it's a baby realize that before Jesus Christ we have a responsibility to deny ourselves, to lay down our very lives and pick up that cross, whatever it is, to follow him, to do or not do to the least of these, his brothers, because we do or not do to him. Verse 15, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. Life and prosperity. Do you know there are people today that would try to separate prosperity from life? I mean, we're really into prosperity this year, aren't we? Do you hear anything else at the presidential debates except prosperity and the lack of it in this country? Well, you know why we're not going to have prosperity in this country? Do you know why the church is going to be tormented? Because, you see, life and prosperity are to be together, not separate. It's either life and prosperity or death and destruction. Verse 16, For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. We're supposed to increase. We've killed 30 million children in this country alone in the last 20 years. I laugh when, when, when they talk about the Social Security system and what they're going to do to salvage it. There are 30 million people already that are supposed to be working and will be working over the next dozen years or so to support that system that aren't going to be. In our increase is our prosperity. But here's the heart of what I want to say in verse 17. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, my retirement could have been a god to me. Anything that comes between me and what Jesus Christ calls me to do in this day is an idol. And abortion is not the national sin. The national sin is idolatry. Those things that we are allowing to come between us and whatever it is that Jesus calls us to do. Oh, hear that. I declare to you this day that you will certainly then be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. For this day I call heaven and earth as a witness against you. Now, I don't know how many other times God says that in the Bible. I couldn't find any. Maybe there's somewhere else where God calls heaven and earth as a witness against us. And in what context? He says this. I have set before you life and death 
blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live, so that you may love the Lord your God and listen to his voice and hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life. Beloved, there are babies that are dying and it's not going to stop there. And it's not going to become easier. Do you hear that sound? Tonight there are babies that are sleeping in their mother's womb for the last time warm and secure tonight that tomorrow morning they'll be taken to a killing center and they'll never live to make a sound like that you'll never hear their voice and neither will the kingdom of God hear their voice and the world will be affected because we allow that to happen this day not tomorrow this day he sets before us life and death choose life so that you and your children may live it's that simple there is no political solution to child killing in America God will show that to us. But just as there is no economic Messiah, there is no Messiah in the White House. It does not matter who is in the White House. What matters is who is in my house? Who is in residence here? Who is it that empowers me to go forward and to stop the killing and to say, you will not do to Jesus what you are doing 4,500 times a day in this country because it is Jesus. Because he says, whatever you do or do not do to the least of these, my brothers, you do or not do to me. When you leave here tonight, or even as you sit here now, begin asking Jesus what it is that you are to do for his kingdom's sake. Lord, what am I to do? Please be sure that your hope is in nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness, because if your hope is in anything else, you have a false hope. Without faith, the Bible says, it is impossible to please God. We must first believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Tonight, if nothing else happens, I'm asking you to seek God, to seek him. With all my heart and soul and mind and strength, I love Jesus. With all my heart and soul and mind and strength, it's my prayer that you will hear his word tonight and lay down your life at all costs to all idols. Pick up your cross and do what he did for us. As rescuers, we simply put our bodies between the victim and the killer, passively, prayerfully, nonviolently. We interpose ourselves that Jesus as our example, he interposed himself for us on that cross. You see, he put himself between me and eternal death. And he says, Chet, if you're to be my disciple, follow me. All the way. All the way. God bless you. So many of you have given of yourselves so much more than I in helping to stop the murder of unborn babies. In 1973, when Roe versus Wade was, decision was made by the Supreme Court, I was troubled, but I have tried to wear blinders. God called me 41 years ago to help take the gospel to the ends of the earth, and I've tried to be faithful to that to do everything I do every day in light of the Great Commission. How will this meeting help to accelerate the Great Commission? How will this appointment lead more people to Christ? With the passing of the years, I've become increasingly concerned that I'm not doing enough to stand between those who take the lives of these innocent unborn babies. I do not wish to, to be diverted from what God has called me to do and what he's called us as a movement to do, but someone must, as you have been doing and others of us must join with you to see that this Holocaust is stopped. One evening, Bonnet and I were having dinner with a couple of members of parliament and the woman who happened to be a medical doctor and a member of parliament was 
very responsive to the gospel, though not a believer at the time. She later became a believer before we left. But I asked her questions about abortion. She said the average Russian woman has eight abortions in her lifetime. And I said, what does that do to the psychic? The, well, how does that affect the woman emotionally? And she as a woman, as a medical doctor and a member of parliament, had strong convictions, even though she was not a believer, that the women were being victimized and they were suffering dramatically because of this particular problem. I was in China where I met with the head of the medical association for, for a large province who invited us to come and establish a facility there at a time when the thaw seemed to be genuine and then of course the problems arose. But I asked him, how many abortions would you estimate take place in China? And he thought for a while and he guessed maybe 10 million each year. Well, this goes on all over the world. There are tens of millions of babies that are never allowed to see the light of day, never allowed to be born in this world. And one has to ask the question, why? Why? While we were in Russia, we took a survey of a number of the university women. Someone else had done a similar survey, and we were checking out their authenticity. And the question was asked of these sharp, young, brilliant, many of those university students are really sharp. How would you like, what profession would you choose if you had any choice? And almost 100% of them said, we would prefer to choose to be a prostitute for hard, for hard currency, Dutch marks or dollars. Almost every one of these university women. Why? Because they did not understand the Word of God. This holy, inspired, and errant Word of God has been ignored for 73 years in the Soviet Union. They have no standards now. And right is wrong and wrong is right. Who knows what is what? And so it is in China. But it was in 1947 that two men were, was, were appointed to the Supreme Court who were both members of the ACLU, dedicated the overthrow of our government. This is documented as historical fact. It was not long until they came up with an unprecedented decision. Never in history had the Supreme Court come up with any decision that was not, that did not have several previous related examples. But they had none. They just simply declared the, the policy of separation of church and state. That was the beginning. The next step was no prayer, no Bible reading in the schools, 62 and 63. And by 1973, Roe versus Wade. And the Supreme Court, a body of a small group of men, led a revolution that is destroying our nation. Prior to 1947, when the Supreme Court made that infamous decision without any press and separation of church and state, which is a myth. Our founding fathers had no such idea at all. And that's not just my own opinion. If we are to return to any semblance of morality and spirituality based on the Word of God, we must call the clergy and the laymen of America to fast, to repent, to pray, and obey God. Jesus said in John 14, 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. We don't love God. We say we love God, but he said, You don't really love me unless you obey me. And he that loveth me shall be loved to my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. God wants to bless us, but he will not bless us unless we obey him. Judy, thank God for you and for all who stand with you in this
commitment across our land. May your numbers increase. May our numbers increase. Because I'm with you. My name is Uriah Kimming and I'm nine. My name is Ava Kimming and I'm 11. My name is Abigail Kimming and I'm seven. My name is Luke Kimming and I'm five. My name is Joanna Kimming and I'm six. It's really six. His name is Josiah and he's two, three. <laughs> Thank you. 